go through life going without God. And just because you became a Christian does not guarantee that you're going with God, right? Just having a name, a label, or, or a, a baptism certificate, if you've got such a thing, which I don't, but you know what I mean, right? Just, just having these things doesn't mean we're going with God. But what happens when we go with God? What really happens? And how can we be sure that we're going with God? And what I'd like to do is illustrate this by looking at the last part of Acts 14 and then tying that together with what we see in Acts 13 and 14, some bits of which I've preached here um, over the last little while. So let's start off by looking at the end of chapter 14 and verses... 20 to 28, and then we'll set that in the context of everything else in those two chapters of chapters 13 and 14. So what it says is this, verse 20, this is in, um, this is in Lystra. After the disciples had gathered around him, because Paul has been stoned and left for dead, which is a bad day at the office, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. They said, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Ataliah. From Ataliah, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work that they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So where are we and what are all these places mentioned here? So these are, this is the journey, what's commonly referred to as Paul, Paul's first missionary journey, which is a bit... A bit, um, you know, not quite fair on Barnabas, is it? Because it's <clears throat> Barnabas and Paul, but never mind. Anyway, they set out from at that Antioch, two Antiochs, Pisidian Antioch, Syrian Antioch. They're there for quite some time. The Lord, it says in chapter 13, uh, by the Spirit, uh, decided, said, send them off for me. They were prayed over and fasted over at the beginning of chapter 13. And then they were sent out, it says, by the Spirit. So it wasn't men, it wasn't human beings that sent them out. The Spirit sent them on this journey, even though the Spirit didn't tell them where they were going, or how they were going to get there, or what was going to happen. But they were just sent by the Spirit. And sometimes my life feels like that. I've been sent by the Spirit. I don't know where I'm going, or what's going to happen, right? Maybe your life sometimes feels like that. So they go down to Cyprus, and in Cyprus, they go to Barnabas' hometown, and they preach the word there in this part of Cyprus. Then they go to Paphos, where they meet Sergius Paulus, the proconsul. They convert him. Uh, Elimas the sorcerer tries to confuse the, uh, his master, and that's when, do you know what happens? What does Paul do to, to that sorcerer? Do you remember? He goes, blind. he goes blind. Well, yeah, he says, you know, you're an enemy, you're a child of the, the devil, an enemy of all that is right, and he, he curses, kind of, uh, that sorcerer, and he goes blind for a while, which is pretty powerful. And the proconsul is amazed, and they preach the word there, and then they go off up to Perga, they preach there, they go to Pisidian Antioch, and in Pisidian Antioch, oh sorry, before that, in, in this area, that's where John Mark leaves them. Do you remember the relationship between John Mark and Barnabas? Do you remember the relationship? Cousins, right? It's his cousin, I think. They go for right saying that. And he leaves them and goes back to Jerusalem at that point. Now we know later that that was a desertion. It doesn't say that in this passage, but later on we learn he abandoned the mission. He went back. Uh, then they go off up to a Pisidian Antioch where Paul preaches an amazing summary of the Old Testament and how that fits with the Messiah. And that's something we'll look at another time. 
He preaches what's called good news there. It says the whole city, here's the, here's the gospel. The whole city, tens of thousands of people, many Gentiles turn to the Lord and believe. The word spread through the whole region of that part of Asia Minor. And then they are expelled from the city. Of course, this becomes a bit of a theme. They go somewhere, they preach, a lot of people become Christians and they get kicked out, they move on. And it says that they were filled with joy in the spirit. Then they go to Iconium. Where are we? Iconium. Iconium is there. They go to Iconium in chapter 14. It says, great numbers turn to the Lord. Then some people come and poison the minds of the people that uh, Paul and Barnabas are preaching to. But they persevere in their preaching. I think I preached on that passage here. And they persevere. And then they learn there's a plot against their lives. And so then they leave the, the city of Iconium. And they go on down to Lystra, which is the city just before the passage we read. And in Lystra, Paul heals a man, just like Jesus did, and he heals a man, not even by touching him, he just says, be healed, just a remote kind of healing, which is an amazing thing. The man is healed, and there Paul preaches the first sermon to a pagan crowd. This is a crowd of people that doesn't include Jews, as far as we can tell, and he preaches a very different lesson, a bit like in Acts, Acts when he's at Athens, and preaches a very different lesson there to those philosophers. Very interesting. And after he's done that, and they've won a lot of people to the Lord, he gets stoned. And he's left for dead. They think he's dead. They drag him out of the city. Literally, they drag him. That's what they do with the stoning. They, they, they stone you, and then they drag you out. So he was literally dragged by his ankles out of the city along a dusty path. Not, not, not nice surface, right? He, he th they think he's dead. He's as good as dead. And they just dump him outside the city. And then the brave disciples gather around him. I mean, considering what's just happened to him, I think it's incredibly brave of him to do that. And it turns out, I, we don't know exactly what happened, but he gets up, he's okay. God heals him, I guess, miraculously. And he goes, of all places, back into the city. What are you thinking? I mean, I think I'd take the next bus out of town. So anyway, he goes into the back, and then they go on to Derby. The last spot uh, on their tour, if you like. And this is large numbers become Christians there, as we just read. And then they go back. They retrace their steps all the way back up here, bang through here and here, and back to Syrian Antioch, strengthening the churches and appointing elders before they get back to Syrian Antioch and, and report. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to draw a few threads from chapters 13 and 14 together and see what we might make of it, what might be useful for us here in Lower Early. Because we see in chapters 13 and 14 a lot of people becoming Christians, a lot of people, large numbers. We see them making disciples everywhere. We see a lot of opposition, a lot of setbacks for Paul and Barnabas and the early church. We see a lot of firsts. Things are happening for the first time. There's no plan here. It just the spirit leaves them. But here's the thing that I really love about this passage, or these, this, this first missionary journey, amongst many other things, is the way that Paul and Barnabas, despite no plan, despite it being chaotic, despite opposition, despite a lot of setbacks along the way, that they retain, they retain something. On the next slide. Can we just poke that for me? Something's happened there. I don't know what. I must have pressed the wrong button. They retain an undiminished enthusiasm for the things of God. An undiminished enthusiasm. I find this hugely impressive. Inspiring and not a little convicting. An undiminished enthusiasm for the people of God. Oh, for the things of God. This is what it means to go with God. I believe when we go with God through our lives, our daily lives, our weekly lives, at home, with our neighbours, people we're reaching out to, at work, with our families, when we go with, a, with God, we can go through life with undiminished enthusiasm for the things of God. This is what we see with Paul and Barnabas. So let's talk about two things and, and flesh this out a little bit from this and see if this will work. It won't. Never mind. So, Wally, next slide, please. 
When we go with God and we have undiminished enthusiasm, we bear God's fruit. That's what happens. We bear God's fruit. Not our fruit, not, not some person's fruit, not something that we've made happen, but we bear God's fruit. God is the one who enables us to bear <coughs> fruit as they did. And we see his fruit in two particular forms in the first missionary journey in chapters 13 and 14, I would suggest. Two in particular. Ah, it's working again. Okay. The first is enthusiastic outreach. Who's this? Brenda. It's Brenda. You've heard what happened this last week, right? Yeah. That she, Brenda is, she's 80. Don't, don't tell anybody. She's not, <laughs> not supposed to know people's age. She's 80 years old. And she got, she's in her retirement home kind of place where she lives. She uh, invited some people to a Bible study, Bible discussion that she was going to do herself. I gather she's never done this before. She's doing a first. It's a first for her at the age of 80. Two of her friends came. More are going to come next time, apparently. I mean, and that is undiminished enthusiasm for the things of God. Mm. Undiminished despite age. Despite, I'm sure, she must have some health challenges. We don't get to 80 without some. She might have other things on her mind. She's the only one there. She's not got much backup. Mm. It's just her on her own. But she has undiminished enthusiasm for the things of God. Isn't that wonderful? I want to be like that when I'm 80. So here's the thing. To be like that when I'm 80, it would probably be handy if I was like that now. Right? Why wait till you're 80? Some of us might not even get there, so you know, I don't know. But let's hope we all do. But I, I just love this. This undiminished enthusiasm. It's a, it's a lesson for all of us that we're not too old. Or we're not too inexperienced. But we're not too untrained. I don't think Brenda... I mean, Brenda's a mature Christian, you could say, but she's not done this kind of thing before. Stepping out. You know, this ministry will be as spiritually rich and, 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 and vital and energetic, if you like, as, as the individual. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's us as individuals that give this ministry what it is. It's not, it's not some kind of mystical force. It's about our choices, about how we step out in faith. As most of you know, a week ago Friday, I was taking a funeral for this elderly lady, uh, Pat Palmer, who, as, again, I think most of us would know, is the mother of Wendy Palmer, who's now Wendy Gajewski. And, they, and she and Steve and their children were here two Sundays ago, right? And they came over to, for the funeral uh, of, uh, of Wendy's mother. That's the mother there with one of the grandchildren. But what I didn't know about Pat Palmer was how she became a Christian. And I found out at the funeral. Because at the funeral, Brian and Gillian Miller were there. And some of us will know them. Gillian Miller became a Christian about 30 years ago. She was, you know, uh, uh, she was uh, sitting on a train not long after becoming a Christian. And then she's sitting on the train... There was a young lady sitting next to her, and they start, started a conversation. And that young lady turns out to be Wendy. And she, as a, as a result of the conversation, Wendy came to church. They did some Bible studies. Wendy became a Christian. And then the first thing Wendy did was, of course, reach out to her mother, um, Pat, who at that point was into her 60s. She died at 95 years old. Wow. So she was already in her 60s. And Wendy reached out to her mother, and her mother agreed to do some Bible studies with Gillian and her daughter. That must be some serious humility right there, right? Your daughter and this stranger you've never met before, who's the age of your daughter, teaching you the Bible. And she studied the Bible, she became a Christian, and she died faithful to God. You've got to ask yourself, who, who was the... Why did that happen and who, who gets the glory? It must be God. Because yeah. all Gillian did was talk to a person sitting next to her on a train. She didn't do anything more than just that. And all Wendy did was go and talk to her mother and say, would you like to, da, da, da. Right? It's, it's not our strength and power that make these things happen. 
But when you have undiminished enthusiasm for the things of God, you seize the opportunities that are presented to you. Yeah. And that's all that they did. What an honor it was to do the funeral and to be there and to say farewell to someone who had finished the race well and who we will see again. You know, the, the small decisions we make with God have a huge and eternal impact. We don't have to make, most of the time, big decisions. We just need to make the right small ones. It's most of the Christian life. Yeah. So we see that bearing God's fruit happens when we've got an undiminished enthusiasm for the things of God, but also enthusiastic strengthening. We see Paul and Barnabas doing a very interesting thing when they get to the end of this first missionary journey and they decide to go back to Antioch to give a report. Let me go actually go back to the map. Because they finish in Derby, and the first thing they do is go back to Lystra, where Paul was stoned. Now, I don't know about you, but basically, think about this. Firstly, Tarsus is near Derby, and that's where Saul's from. That's his hometown, right? So he, he could go home and see his family and his friends, right? And also, they're going from there to Syrian Antioch, and it's a lot closer to go east than it is to go west yeah. and there and all around there, right? So why, why do that? Why go back to the place where you got stoned? Why go the long way around? You've got to give a report. Let's get back to Syria, Syrian and Antioch. Let's just get back there, right? Much quicker, much simpler, much safer. But what impresses me about that is that they have undiminished enthusiasm for strengthening young Christians. They want to go back to these small, new churches and strengthen them. And appoint elders as well, but they strengthen and appoint elders. I love the heart they have here. And I don't know about you, but strengthening, I find strengthening embarrassing. So the, the, the picture at the top there is my um, body strengthening... Um, regime given to me by somebody. So I decided earlier this year that uh, I want to be a little bit more um, just physically stronger generally. And so I've been doing a few things. And I talked to my wife about this and she said, why don't you contact a friend of ours called Debbie Bishop, uh, who is a personal trainer and an expert in this kind of thing, and get a personalized uh, training regime from her in terms of body strength, not uh, aerobic fitness, but the sort of body strength stuff. Because I got dodgy knees, I've got a problem with the disc in my neck. I get, a, get quite a lot of pain, which keeps me awake at night, actually, the, the neck pain and so on. So let's get Debbie over. I said, that's a great idea. So I ring Debbie. She she comes over. And then, you see, I realize how um, embarrassing this is. Because there I am. And she's, she's a, uh, one of her specialities is Pilates, which I've never done. But if you know anything about Pilates, it's about small movements done very slowly, which are actually really hard. And so she says, just move your leg like this. And I move my leg like that three or four times. And I'm ex I can't move it anymore. Mm. And it, it, you have ever had this thing where you're exercising and your muscles start to shake, mm. right? You can't hold a position. I've done like three of these. I did, she could do three press-ups, not even full press-ups, just slight small ones. After the third one, I'm like, I'm shaking like this. I'm so embarrassed. I was supposed to be a man. And here I am in front of this lady, uh, just shaking. I can't even do three of these things. Uh, I just, so, I'm so embarrassed. And also, I mean, I'm only doing these little movements, but I'm sweating like a pig. I'm just, sweat's pouring off me with these small little stupid movements of my leg and my neck. And my head. If you want to get stronger, you've got to get vulnerable. And a church will only be as strong as two things, as the willingness of the members to be vulnerable with one another and the willingness to then help strengthen one another and have an undiminished enthusiasm for helping one another be stronger, even though the incremental growth and strengthening may be small <coughs> by day, by week, by month, by year. But to trust God that that strengthening will produce fruit. It's really important that we work on our vulnerability with one another. The thing is, I'm relatively strong in some areas, but weak in others. I don't need Debbie to make everything in my body strong. Some parts of my body are reasonably strong, but my knees and my neck are the problem. So she's got a bespoke regime for me. 
I texted her afterwards and I said, uh, how often should, should I do these? Hoping she'd say once a week, you know, <laughs> twice maybe. She said minimum three times a week. Oh, God, they are really hard. <laughs> uh, I did the first set with her. I did two more sets, so two on my own. After that second set I did a, a few days later, I already had less neck pain. I already started sleeping better. Isn't that interesting? It's painful to do them, it's difficult to do them, it's embarrassing to do them in front of her, but what do I want? Do I want to sleep? Do I want to be stronger? Do we want to grow as in Christ? Vulnerability and an undiminished enthusiasm to strengthen one another is part of the package if that's going to happen. And we see that in, in chapters 13 and 14 and in the brave, compassionate concern of Paul and Barnabas for the early Christians in the early church there. So we bear the fruit of God. The second thing, I've just got two things today, is uh, when we go with God and we have this undiminished enthusiasm for the things of God, then we bear with setbacks well. We bear well with the setbacks when they come, because they do come, don't they? There are challenging things in life. Paul and Barnabas kept going despite all of the challenges that came their way. And some of the setbacks that they encountered were external, you might say, and some were internal. So let me explain what I mean by that. External setbacks. A photograph of me and my wife and my children back in 1995 or 6, around that. My mum and dad there visiting us when we were leading the church in Manchester. The church in Manchester, in terms of the churches of our churches in the United Kingdom, is the most persecuted of all of our churches. Uh, we had the most opposition, we had the most trouble from the press and from people uh, of any of our uh, congregations. Um, in fact, the church in Manchester was being persecuted before it started. Uh, there were articles in the uh, local Manchester Evening News before the planting even got there. Um, and when Penny and I were there for five years, we had a number of problems. We had well, we were infiltrated by uh, a, a radio reporter, uh, a TV reporter, who came in and, and recorded a t a one of our church services with a pinhole buttonhole, um, sort of um, a, a pinhole camera in his button, and recorded the the, the, the service and, and all that. I was accosted, jumped on by a radio reporter as I was getting on a bus, and he followed me onto the bus and put a microphone in my mouth. So, Mr. Cox, what do you say to Dudla Dudla? I was like, I don't know, I'm just having a, I'm getting on the bus, leave me alone. This happened a few times. Um, there was a newspaper article, I, I was photographed surreptitiously through, through bushes, by, with, a long, <laughs> with, a, with a long zoom lens by somebody. This is a long, I won't tell you the whole story, it's for another time, but there was a criminal, his wife became a Christian, he was in prison, he came out and he didn't like the fact that she was now a Christian, so he started to uh, try and create trouble. And... Um, and he did create quite a lot of trouble. My wife and I had to move out of our house for two weeks because he was threatening us. Uh, my wife was physically assaulted. I was physically assaulted several times. Um, it was a, and some of the women in the church were assaulted leaving church meetings. We had to have the brothers escort them uh, uh, from church to the bus stop or wherever they were going. I mean, uh, there's a lot of stories. I won't tell you them all now. But, you know, when you get that kind of opposition, you begin to wonder why you're doing what you're doing, whether you're doing it right. But the thing is that it was, it was not fun. I wouldn't want to repeat it. But the thing is, it bonded us as a church because it reminded us of why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. We had to go through those setbacks. We lost venues. It's funny. We have such a struggle in a way with venues at the moment, right? We're talking about venues with Bracknell. When I heard, honestly, I just say it like this. You know, when, when Brank was being, the venue there has been going through its problems and, and we don't like the room we've been meeting in, I've heard some people say, this is terrible, this is awful, this is, you have no idea, honestly. So we turned up at a venue and it was, oh, sorry, we, we, we heard that you're a cult so you can't meet here. We turned up at another venue and it, we met in some rough places. I mean, we met in places which were dangerous. We met in places that... You walked in, and if you took a deep breath, you'd get some cannabis poisoning, I'm telling you. I mean, there, there were some rough spots. Um, venue after venue was turned down to us and closed to us. We met in homes, we met, I mean, you know that thing in Hebrews about they met in caves and holes in the ground? That's what it was like. It, we've met in some bad places, but the thing is, it bonded us. It bonded us. It reminded us of what we're doing. The setbacks should not necessarily take away our enthusiasm. Yeah. 
indeed in some ways it should it should give us more enthusiasm for the things of God because it reminds us why we're doing what we're doing. Paul and Barnabas did not lose their sense of enthusiasm as they went through these difficult times. So sometimes the setbacks are external. Stuff happens to us that's just not fair in life, right? But sometimes they're internal. So I show you here a photograph of my best friend from university days in my first year. And I stress first year. My best friend is Mike. That's the photograph. I don't know how recent that is. That's more recent, obviously. That's not the university days. Um, that's, that's quite recently. Uh, Mike was my best friend from about October of the first term till about April uh, of, the next, of that year, that academic year. And then I turned up at a party on my own um, and he walked in to the party holding hands with my girlfriend. <laughs> and I had, I then, I, I still remember this vividly. He walked in with her, I was this side of the room, he was the other side of the room, walked in holding hands. Mike, hold it. I, to say I was surprised was a, an understatement. It's one of those classic moments. He'd stolen my girlfriend, Lynn. Now, um, he stopped being my friend, as you might imagine, at that point. As I felt I, I'd been stabbed in the back. I thought we were friends. And, you know, I, now, I must also tell you that it was my fault. Oh. Well, it was really, because I treated Lynn terribly. I mean, I wasn't a Christian person. I was terrible to her. In fact, the two weeks before that happened, I hadn't even spoken to her. And we lived in the same hall of residence, basically. I hadn't even spoken to her. I mean, I was a terrible boyfriend. So don't feel too bad for me. <laughs> but, but you can understand the shock. And they went on to be boyfriend, girlfriend. They didn't end up married. He married somebody else. And of course, I married somebody else. And of course, actually, now I look back on it, he did me a favor. Yeah. Right? Otherwise, I wouldn't have been met Penny, my wife. And actually, I think he did her a favor because I was terrible. <laughs> so everybody won. But that feeling of someone you thought you could trust betraying you. Oh, that's a horrible feeling. And sometimes what gets us down in the Christian life is not external opposition, but it's feeling let down by your husband, your wife, your kids, your parents, people in church you thought you could rely on, you felt you could. You, there's been some sin among, between one another or against you. Or, and and that, can, that can suck the life out of you, can't it? Spiritually. With Paul and Barnabas, what we learn is that John Mark actually been abandoned and deserted them. That must have been really hard, especially for Barnabas as, as his cousin. Now we know later on that John Mark gets rehabilitated, but not at this point. Not where they're in Lystra and Derby and, and all these places. And yet they don't let that trouble them get on their minds to where they're like, you know what, this, this preaching business, this reaching out, this, this missionary journey, forget all that. I mean, if we're going to be betrayed like this, I, I don't think I'm up for this. It's not to say they didn't feel deeply the sense of betrayal, but they didn't allow it to diminish their enthusiasm for the, the work of God. Isn't that impressive? I find that very challenging and very impressive in equal measure. So let's wrap this up with a few concluding thoughts. How do we deal with this? How do we keep our enthusiasm undiminished no matter the setbacks we go through the challenges we go through or the disappointments we have well I think it comes down to a simple thing the first the love of God it, it's got to be that we need God we want God he is what we desire uh, we talked about this on Friday nights in the first class in the Holy Spirit that when we cry Abba Father we're asking for God's face we're not asking for his power at that point. We're asking for him. We need him. And our times of quiet with God, when we go out to pray or we read his word, we really need primarily, first and foremost, to be wanting him. He's come to live in us. It says in John 14, verse 23. The Father and the Son have come to live in us. And we know the Spirit is a deposit in us. God lives in us. He wishes to make his home with us. 
We need Him. We need a relationship with Him. We need to be to know that we are loved by Him. Now, it must be the first place we go if we're going to expect or hope to have an undiminished enthusiasm for the things of God. We need to be confident of His love. But secondly, also His competency. Now, I would, that's an interesting word. I would personally, the way I frame that, if you like, is God's competency is about two things, maybe more, but at least two things. The first is His power. His strength, his power. And the second is his wisdom. God is competent because he is powerful. And God is competent because he is wise. He ultimate, ultimately wise, of course. Infinitely wise, you might say, compared to us at least. He has power, he has strength, and he has wisdom. What do I need in my life? I need strength, right? I'm weak. I need strength. And what do I need? I need wisdom. Why? Because I'm spiritually ignorant. And, or, and limited in my understanding. And so if I can trust God's wisdom and God's strength, then I will have the strength I need and the wisdom I need for the things of God, and that will help me with my enthusiasm. So I'd encourage us to think about that for this week, maybe for our times of quiet, our prayer times and so on. It would be good to be praying about being confident of the love of God and confident of the competency of God. And if we can get that, I think the rest falls into place. Yeah. And we will maintain an undiminished enthusiasm for the things of God, no matter what's going on at work with our kids, with our parents, like my mum's hip operation tomorrow and, you know, and Ian's father's stent operation tomorrow, what, whatever's going on with our bank balance or our health, we'll cope. And we'll cope not just by bearing up and gritting our teeth, but actually we'll still find a way to have undiminished enthusiasm for bearing the fruit of God, for seeing people become Christians, for strengthening one another, and for all the other things that God may have in mind for us. So I hope and pray that you and I can grow in an undiminished enthusiasm for the things of God. Thank you very much.